So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us for this first quarterly meeting of the 2020 Census Black Roundtable. Uh, we are so excited about this convening um, where we will talk about the initial OMB proposal on race and ethnicity standards and accurately counting the Black diaspora. I'm Jerrica Richardson and I serve as a Senior Vice President for Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives at the Nas National Urban League. Uh, and right now I will turn over um, this meeting uh, to one of our co-conveners, uh, President and CEO of the National, uh, National Urban League, Mark H. Morial. Mark? Thank you very much, Jerrica. And first of all, good afternoon to all. I wanna thank uh, Jerrica and Ihioma and Jerry and Yvette and the entire National Urban League team for their work in serving as the conveners uh, and administrators of the Black Census Roundtable. And I wanna thank all of you, the members and participants of the Black Census Roundtable uh, with, uh, with, with, with the reminder that we came together to try to uh, elevate, consolidate and ensure a strong voice on policy related to the census. All too often there's a sense that the census comes every 10 years and then it's over. The truth is, is that the planning the design, the data gather, gathering that the census does uh, happens every year in the 10 year run up uh, to the decennial census. And so uh, it is important that we remain engaged uh, throughout, not just when it's time for the count uh, and, and, be, and remain engaged on a lot of matters of public policy. We all know that in the last few months, quite a few things have happened and on the table now is a discussion about the recent OMB initial proposal to revise the race and ethnicity standards. Uh, this, uh, if you will, proposal will impact everything we care about from voting to gerrymandering, economic support and political representation. Uh, so it's very important that we dive in, we dig in and we seek a consolidated point of view, a consolidated position so we can apply pressure on OMB and census for the right outcome, a just and equitable outcome. So with that, I'm proud to uh, introduce my co-convener, my sister in the struggle, a dynamic woman, and I'm always appreciative of the work that we've done together and we continue to do together. That is none other than the CEO and president of the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation and the convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. It's Melanie Campbell. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, Mark, uh, and, and, and the whole Urban League team and, and partners. It's great to be on, on this uh, Zoom with everybody. Had a great time with you last week, and that was really, really fun at your legislative conference. And I'm getting ready for mine this week, so you know I'm a little, 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 little bit uh, uh, scattered. But what I thought about, uh, um, Mark and everyone, was just thinking about how when we when we had to fight uh in, when it came to the census to get uh the ability for us to have more than tell somebody check block and fill out a blank line uh and how that fight was going into the 2020 census and you've said it already it starts it's a it's, it's an ongoing process it never stops uh and What's very important about this roundtable is that we're, we're doing that. And, and Jerry Green knows from her history how important that is that we uh, weigh in uh, when those these kinds of changes are made. And as Mark stated, it will impact uh, uh, um, our ability to build power, maintain, sustain power, whether you're talking about economically uh, or politically, most especially. It affects us when it comes to being able to utilize this data. So. I'm excited about uh, and thank all your whole team and everybody uh, for doing the doing the, the the work that just ain't sexy, right? You know, and that's because it because it, 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 it but it's so much at stake when it comes to what we're doing here today. So glad to continue to partner and looking forward to uh, working with you over this next decade. Really, <laughs> thank you, Melanie, and all thank right. you Thanks very much. Lot. And thank you for your participation uh, in last week's legislative policy conference, which uh, was a big success. And 
uh, well attended and impactful. So thank you very much. And again, thanks to the team for LPC. At this time, we're going to uh, pray for a moment and uh, set up the remainder of the discussion. Proud to introduce a special advisor to us on faith, uh, faith affairs. He's the pastor of the First Baptist Church of East Helmhurst in Queens, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Patrick Young. Reverend Young. Is Reverend Young with us? I was just checking. I thought he was. He was. I don't see Reverend Young at the moment, Mark. Uh, would anyone like to volunteer to serve as chaplain quickly? Well, Mark, you want me to do it? You want would, to go ahead, go ahead Melanie. I used to be married to a preacher. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Melanie. I digress. Uh, uh, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Mother God, thank you for this opportunity to gather once again uh, with this Black Census Roundtable and all who are gathered. Uh, bless this gathering and the conversations and the strategy and the thinking and the powerful minds that are coming together to ensure that our people are not invisible, that we are counted to the fullest extent that we can be, and that whatever rules that are made are those that are fair to our communities, as well as the, uh, the communities at large. Thank you. In your mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, back to you, Jerrica. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Melanie. Um, right now, I'd love to turn the floor over to my amazing colleague in the Washington Bureau, uh, Yvette Baranumako. Yvette is Interim Executive Director of the National Urban League's Washington Bureau, and she also serves as Vice President of Policy. Yvette? Thank you, Jerrica. Um, in Congress, the House Oversight Committee and Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee organized their membership and subcommittees for the 118th Congress. So we have a number of updates to share regarding that organization. Um, on the Senate side, the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee continues to have Senator Gary Peters from Michigan as chairman, who's, a long, who's long prioritized the census, uh, with the ranking member being Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. For the House Committee, there have been significant changes with the change in party leadership. The new chairman is Congressman James Comer from Kentucky. Ranking member is Jamie Raskin. And unfortunately, the previous subcommittee on civil rights and civil liberties that the committee had, which had jurisdiction over the census and the Census Bureau was unfortunately eliminated, which means that none of the new subcommittees has jurisdiction over the census or the Census Bureau. Uh, Chairman Comer has said that any issues that aren't specifically assigned to a subcommittee uh, would be overseen by the full committee, but we have yet to see how that looks like, and we'll be sure to keep everyone updated on that. Um, the National Urban League uh, sent a letter to Speaker McCarthy condemning the elimination of all of these civil rights and DEI subcommittees across Congress uh, to really emphasize the impact that it would have on key civil rights issues like the census. We're already seeing the impact by not having it prioritized in the Oversight Committee. Um, and on the appropriation side, uh, the president, as you all know, released uh, his 2024 budget, fiscal year 2024 budget uh, last week with a total of $1.6 billion being proposed to the Census Bureau, which is $121 million over fiscal year 23. More details are expected to be released today, so we will be sure to keep uh, everyone updated on that. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jerrica. Thank you, Yvette, for those updates from Washington. There is obviously a lot happening there and we appreciate you all, um, you and your team, just keeping us posted on all the movements. Um, right now, I'd love to turn the floor over uh, to Yoma Iruka. Ioma is our special advisor for census at the National Urban League. Uh, Ioma will serve as the moderator for our next conversation and introduce our speakers. Ioma. Thank you, Jerrica. I'm a glad, glad to be here with you all. Um, and I'm gonna have the pleasure of setting up our sort of the larger part of our conversation for about the next or so 30 minutes. But to set that up, I actually wanted to just do um, share just a, a few points 
um, about the initial OMB proposal around race and ethnicity. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, it's my right screen. It's my right screen. Okay, so I'm just, I just want to set up a little bit and then I'm going to actually then introduce um, our speaker. So you're looking at my right screen, right? You're looking at the right screen. Okay, thank you. So really, just to quickly just orient us to uh, this SPD 15, as they call it, uh, which is a statistical policy directive number 15, and it was established in the late 1970s, and it was last revised in 1997. And really, the whole idea of SPD 15 is to really to enforce civil rights uh, laws, right, which again, to address all the sort of the, the racial discrimination that was happening, obviously, prior to the 1970s. And it was really to provide common language, to promote uniformity, uh, to compare our groups and consistencies across federal information sort of collection. Um, and it was developed through uh, the Corporate Federal Interagency Working Group process, who really runs all of this. And so why do we care now, right? Why do we need to worry about this whole initial OMB proposal and specifically SBD 15? So some of the arguments as to why is that um, in the last census, or at least before that, there was an increase in some other race category um, meaning that he, a lot of people checked off some other race so that it became that white was the highest, was the, was the largest population followed by some other race. And, and the data indicates that a majority of the some other race was actually Latino uh, people. And also another issue uh, that white is coming up now is that middle, many Middle Eastern and North African respondents view their identity as distinct from the white racial category. So they may say, I may look white, but I'm not treated as white when I sort of go out in society. Um, and also there was a need to better disaggregate data to better understand the within group disparities. Cause you can say Hispanic or Latino, but we know that there's variations if you're Afro-Latino versus if you're a white phenotype a Latino or even uh, between uh, Asian groups, whether you're from Southeast Asia versus uh, uh, China or Japan. So again, thinking through the within group disparities and being able to disaggregate data. And then also there was a challenge with sort of the, the, the inconsistent outdated terminology, like have a Negro um, to describe black people. So, so they also want to sort of do this sort of wholesale review and um, add it to SPD 15. And so right now they're proposing a, a few things that, that I'm hoping um, that now we're going to really speak to experts about in a couple of minutes. One is that um, they want to collect race and ethnicity using one combined question. If you see right here on the right-hand side, this is what it looks like still from, from 1997. This is the last update. And you can see there's a two-step, right? Are you Hispanic or Latino? No or yes. And then what is your race, right? Select one, American Indian, or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian, or other Pacific Islander and white. So those are the two-step question. Um, and so the background is that many, there, the argument is that many Latinos, many people don't, can't tell a difference really between ethnicity and race. And so they're proposing to actually combine them into one race and ethnicity question. They're also proposing to add a MENA category, again, remembering that a lot of people from the Middle East and North Africa do not see themselves as white, whether you're Libyan, Egyptian, right? They don't see themselves as sort of the, the traditional white under the white category. And so they're proposing adding a MENA category under the race and ethnicity uh, um, question. And then they're also requiring a much more of a detailed data uh, race ethnicity category. So usually before you'll just have, you know, white, black, Asian, Native American, et cetera. But now they're proposing a deeper sort of data gathering around your race ethnicity. So, really, uh, so for example, if you're Hispanic, they're gonna gather things like your actual sort of ancestry, like whether you're Dominican or Cuban, or if you're Asian, are you from Jap Japanese or Asian Indian, right? So trying to get a bit more detailed, again, because these large racial ethnic categories are pretty massive, right? And we know there's variations um, within groups, and they're trying to get more at that. And then, of course, I mentioned terminology. Again, remembering that they're going to remove Negro from the Black or African American def definition. They're going to remove Far East from the Asian definition and so on and so forth. So they're gonna make some terminology determination, including taking away majority minority. They're no longer gonna use that terminology, majority minority, um, and we use like subgroups of some other kinds of terms because obviously we're becoming more of a pluralistic sort of society where they eventually may not be a majority um, in reality. 
And so this is what it's going to look like. What they're proposing is to combine the race ethnicity question to add the MENA. And so here's what they're proposing for it to look like in the detail part. So you can see here now you have your white uh, and you have your white sort of category here, your Hispanic, Black, Asian, American Indian, Alaska Native, your Middle Eastern or North African, and then your Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Um, and here is what it looks like in the minimum categories. Again, so basically combines all the ethnic category and as well as the racial categories into one. That is what they're proposing. And so really that's the backdrop of our conversation for the next little bit with our, our expert speakers. And the reason why we're having this conversation in our first quarter meeting is because the National Urban League is being asked to weigh in on this, on this initial proposal by many, many stakeholders. And we thought it was important that we really get feedback and thoughts from experts, including those on the panel today, but also from you all. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? And what do you think? Um, because we are being asked to weigh in on, on this particular proposal. We need to understand the implications of these initial OMB proposal on the Black diaspora community, right? We already see from the census that, that there's a growing Black immigrant population. We know that, that the Black you know, population has been steady for a bit, but we know that some of these may have implications in the potential undercount or, or, or the reduction of Black populations in the U.S. So again, we think about what are the implications of this? And so now it is my pleasure to engage our three experts who are going to share with us kind of their thoughts about this initial MB uh, proposal. And so I'm gonna actually drop my screen so I can actually see my other, I have my, um, my, my notes about each of the speakers. So if we can highlight the speakers as I go, please, Nambe. So our first speaker is gonna be Julio Guete Guevara. He is, hold on, I'm gonna, hold on, I gotta make sure I get my notes together here. Here we go. Um, he is currently the Maryland Regional Manager for CASA in Action, where he oversees important electoral issues facing low-income communities, including the effects of climate change. He is also the Managing Director of SUDEC Incorporated, a consultant firm that promotes sustainable development and delivers services to facilitate the implementation of projects in vulnerable communities. Welcome, Julio. Thank you, thank, thank you Yoma. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, Thank you to uh, the entire team and all those uh, colleagues, familiar faces that I'm seeing on the screen. Uh, just, just to- uh, oh, Before you go, you. let me introduce all the speakers. Hold on, Julio, hold on, hold on. Oh, okay. And then I wanna make sure I can choose the other two speakers. Um, Tanya Hernandez. Uh, Tanya Hernandez is the Archibald R. Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law and an Associate Director of Fordham Center on Race, Law and Justice. She has many publications analyzing the OMB and census racial categories dating back to 1998 and the debate surrounding a proposed multiracial category and the current Latino as a race proposal. Her most recent book is Racial Innocence, a masculine Latino anti-Black bias and the struggle for equality. Welcome, Professor Hernandez. Okay, and finally, last but not least, is Michelle Reed Vasquez. Dr. Michelle Reed Vasquez is an associate professor in the Department of Africana Studies. She's the founding director of the Center for Ethnic Studies Research and leads the afro Latina Dad Studies Initiative. Dr. Reed Vasquez is the author of the year of the Lash, Free People of Color in Cuba in the 19th Century Atlantic World, which was published in 2011. She's also the host and executive producer of the Sali podcast, Dialogues in afro Latina Dad, which launched in 2021. And I have listened to it, it is amazing, so yeah. So we are so fortunate to be able to have this conversation with these amazing group of experts. And I really encourage you all to use the chat to sort of uh, bring out your questions because we wanna be able to have a conversation with them, but I also wanna make sure that all of us in this room are able to come together with them. Um, and I'm going to respectfully ask the speakers because they're all brilliant people with a lot of points that we're gonna try to at least um, and I can say this because as a researcher and a scholar, I tend to talk a little bit more. So, but I will say that just to get through some of the questions that we think is really important so that we can move forward in some sort of decision-making or come to a consensus, um, we want to make sure uh, that everybody has a chance to really hear from you and also engage the, um, our, our um, participants. All right, so I want to just start off the, sort of the question to each of the panelists, and I'll, I'll say start with Julio first, is, you know, please provide a little background about yourself and how you come to this work about OMB, census, and race and ethnicity. Thank you, Yoma. Uh, I can speak now, right? Yes, of course. You, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no, thank you once again. And uh, well, just to tell you a little bit about uh, myself, uh, my, uh, my name is Julio Cesar Witi Guevara. I'm a US naturalized US citizen. I think that's important to mention. Uh, I was born and raised in Honduras. Uh, I'm also a member of the Afro Latino Garifuna community. Uh, which is mostly based in New York, just in the Bronx, there are approximately 300 and something thousand Garifunas. And uh, most of our population or after the US, uh, you're gonna find a significant segment of our populations in Central America. Uh, I'm also a, a member of the NAC. I'm an active member of the National Advisory uh, Committee on Race, Ethnicity and Other Populations since 2021. Uh, it's important to disclose that I'm not uh, speaking on behalf of the NAC. As many, since many of you may be aware, uh, I, uh, we meet twice a year and we provide recommendations. I think that in the room we have other members of the NAC that also uh, have been working uh, with us for quite some time. I am here, uh, you know, uh, because this, this issue uh, goes to the heart of our community. It affects us. A individual institutionality and has a community. And a, I'm here to listen to a change point of view. And thank you once again, Yuma. Would you like to respond next? Hi, I'm Tania Cateri Hernandez. I teach at Fordham Law School. Um, I have long been interested in issues of the census because as a scholar who focuses on anti-discrimination law, uh, the data that comes from the census is critical <laughs> for being able to enforce anti-discrimination law uh, and also to have the Department of Justice aware of what the racial disparities are. Um, I sort of started early on back in 1998, even before that actually, um, when the proposal for the multiracial category came back uh, and I was part of the lobby to say, no, no, that's not the way to deal with people who wanna identify in fluid manners. Um, it should not sacrifice a true reflection of how people's racial appearance uh, is what counts as far as civil rights enforcement is concerned. Uh, and so I was very, no, no, don't put a multiracial box on the census, just in case you care about my politics. Um, and now I'm here to talk about why I think there are some problems with the current proposal as well. Thank you. Welcome, Professor Hernandez. And Dr. Reed Vasquez, would you like to just give a little bit more about yourself? Sure, sure. Thanks so much for having me, um, Michelle Reed Vasquez. Uh, I'm a, trained as a historian of the African diaspora and in, in the Caribbean in particular, but also uh, Afro-Latin America and then the U.S. Afro-Latinx uh, population and those communities and histories. Um, I've always found, as a historian, I've found looking at the census really intriguing about the way people self-identify what are the um, what are the politics of gathering this kind of data. And so that's that so when, I, when this was brought to my attention, I thought, what, what do they want? <laughs> What's going on? Um, and, and also, I think even just in my personal life, I've had lots of conversations growing up over about the census in terms of what it means. What do these numbers mean when, people, when you're counting people and in particular the allocation of resources? So this just raised lots and lots of red flags for me when you're trying to when you're trying to disaggregate uh, information. So that is why I'm here. Thank you. So now let's jump into the meat. So Professor Hernandez, I'm coming to you first. So who is OMB and why should we even care about this OMB proposal? What does that have to do with the census decennial, the ACS and other, like why should we in this room care about this coming from OMB? Okay, so Office of Management and Budget is essentially just sort of the entity in the federal government that since 1997 has designed what the questions are on our statistical government forms. So when you enroll your child in a school, when you go uh, to fill out any other federal government form, in addition to the, the every 10 year, uh, census, it'll ask you questions, are you of Hispanic origin, and separately, what race are you? Um, the purpose of having these systematized boxes that every federal government form has to ask you, and which many state forms emulate as well, so let's, you know, make sure we understand that how vast their influence is, uh, is because it uh, assists in being able to both 
detect disparity across race lines right, and ethnicity for, for, with regards to Hispanic ethnicity, um, and then it, try to do something about it. But if you can't see the disparities, then how do you address them right, in a very systematic way? Um, it also enables uh, litigators in court, you know, uh, as far as being able to say, look, you're not hiring any of these people who live in the neighborhood who are qualified to do this job. And it just so happens that it's a stark disparity between, let's say, white Hispanics and Black Hispanics, even though they both live in the same neighborhood, et cetera. Right? Um, I can give more detail about that, but I know you want me to be quick. Uh, the way it relates to um, what is ACS, that's the American Community Survey, so that in, be every, be in between the every 10 years, right, the government is still interested in being able to see what are the trends within the population, uh, so about housing access and, and other matters. And so in between years, they'll send out a select number of forms um, with detailed questions that we call the American Community Service. American community study. And what that also enables is researchers right, across the country to be able to have more accurate numbers about in between census years, what's happening with the population uh, along race lines. Um, I think I did all the acronyms. Is that right? Uh, OMB, ACS, the census. Okay. <laughs> and that was all you wanted me to say right at this moment. And we'll, yep, and we'll come back to you. I Because I, you said a couple of things that I think is important for Dr. Reed Vasquez to respond to. Right. Since many, many people, at least some, you know, many people don't understand the difference between race and ethnicity. And that's one of the, the rationale for the combined question. I would like Dr. Reed to kind of give us, make, you know, with, with a proposal, make it easier for respondents. And what, how do we describe the difference between race versus ethnicity? And right before she just, I just want to simply uh, say that part of what we need to address as well is how much of this is a made up problem and how much of is it a real problem? Because I've got data that suggests a lot of it is a made up problem. But I turn to my okay, We're going to come back colleague. to that. Just make sure we make get sure. that. Thank you. Michelle, Dr. Reed Vasquez, you want to address the question about, you know, the uh, ethnicity versus race? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think um, Dr. Hernandez really hit the nail on the head that I think this is a made up uh, area of confusion. Whenever I hear that, I'm like, no, and, and particular people in this country. So I understand, you know, people come from different places. They have their own construction of, of identity and particularly turning race. But in this country, there is kind of a coalescing around what those categories mean. And so people, I, people do know what they mean. They, they understand what you mean. They may not want to talk about it. <laughs> they may not want to address kind of the, the complexities of it, but they do understand. And again, if, you, if there's an opportunity to, to, to place, uh, to connect your identity to, di to these different boxes, which I, and this, the, the form that you just showed us does not allow for that, for many people to do that at all. Um, but, but I think if there are spaces to do that, then they'll, they'll, we'll have a clearer picture of them. So race is certainly that, uh, well, ethnicity is about culture, your cultural heritage, your cultural identity. Race is certainly a blend, blended into that. But we, but the way that we make these kinds of racial categories, um, in terms of your your heritage, your not your heritage, your see, I'm not now. I'm now. I'm not uh, doing a great job of explaining the difference between race and ethnicity. But it's it's partly. I'm going to defer to my my colleagues to try to you, get like you're probably trying to say like race is more like your phenotype, what you actually look like. But does uh. Is that what you're trying well, to say? Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, yes, and no, but yes more so, even though, again, that's another kind of construct. And so that's that's the part I think I'm trying to get at, that there's, they're, they're, these are both constructs, but they have significant meaning in our societies. And so being able to articulate what that is um, it becomes especially important if you're trying to count and enumerate and then disperse resources around the country. So I, I think, yeah, but I do think in this country, people do understand what that means, I mean, what the different quote unquote races mean in society and, and, and really and more, and especially what it means in terms of your life expectancies, disparities, all of that. I think people do understand exactly what those are. So Thank you, I want to bring uh, Julio into here. And, but I do want to make sure I come back to what your points were that we're, we're trying to find a solution for a problem that doesn't exist in essence, what I think I heard you all say. But, but Julio, I want to sort of ask you, um, um, you know, the census has been looking at this combination question for at least seven years. 
And so my question is, you know, why were some of some of the issues being raised now? Were they not raised? And I and I imagine also I would love to hear from both uh, Dr. Hernandez and, and Riva Vasquez about that. Um, have any have concerns of any been shared with the bureau and other stakeholders, and, and in what manner? So so Julia, I'd like to hear from you, and obviously we'll, let's uh, kind of circle back again to to the other questions. Thank thank you, Hyoma. Uh, the the issue has been raised for seven years, but we have been asking uh, our stakeholders uh, uh, who have been sitting at the table when that question was asked. Uh, I'm not aware of any Afro Latino organization that you know that have brought this issue to our table, uh, and uh, and I have been in the DMV area for almost 21 years working on this issue, the man, uh, 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 continuously and uninterrupted. Uh, I think that it is extremely important to let people know that while it could be easier to collect data, it's going to be more difficult now to desegregate the data. Uh, and, and communities like our community, the Garifuna community, the Afro Latino community, I will, that will be even further the future child. The second thing that is extremely important to know is that we're going to be taking the approach of many Latin American countries that have taken historically this uh, ethnicity approach. In most Latin American countries, the race and ethnicity question is still great. We are having difficulties in the US uh, and, and, and uh, we're gonna even have more difficulties when it, come in, when it comes to the allocation of resources in, in each of these communities. And, and as a result, I also want to point out that many members of this Latino slash Latinx communities uh, don't want to self-identify as Latinos. Uh, in the case of the Garifunas, Garifunas want to answer Garifunas. And in addition to, at least in the DMV area, uh, where we have a significant segment of the Salvadorian community, Mexican community, and, and Guatemalan community, at least one third of the people that come from Guatemala does, doesn't even speak Spanish very well. And they don't want to self-identify as member of the Latino community. So imagine what it means, what, what it means to combine that question uh, and, and, and at the same time, the impact that we have in members of this community. Something that we have been advocating for, and I think that this is a subject for a separate conversation is to eliminate the word Negro which in Latin America will translate into Afrodescendiente to have a more accurate data. Another word that we want to eliminate uh, or that we expect to at some point eliminate is the word Hispanic because Hispanic uh, still refers to that European center identity that goes, that doesn't go along with the way many of us in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, self-identify. So, uh, we uh, would like to see what or hear more about those organizations that have been speaking for us. We, we I think that we are now, uh, we are in a situation and a position where access to information and technology is so bad, and we'll be more than happy to uh, further uh, develop this conversation. Thank you, Yuma. Thank you. No, thank you for, for I think, making note of some of those, a couple of things. And I, I want to come back to, to your point about the disaggregation data. But before I do, I do want to come back to both what uh, I think uh, Professor Hernandez brought forth earlier, which is sort of, is the, is the solution, is there, is there a problem for the solution? And while you're answering that, Professor Hernandez, I would love for you to sort of respond and, you know, what do you see at least as a benefit, if any, of the initial MB proposal for the Black diasporic uh, population? Um, you know, is there any benefit? But then obviously you can also raise up, what are some of the concerns you have about it? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I think one thing I want to just put out there on the table right away so we can sort of have clarity about sort of what's at stake um, in, in lots of different ways, but um, Latinos who identify as Afro-Latino have been to the extent of one million and counting over a million in 2000, in 2010 and 2020, right, identified as Black. When Latinos check black, really, they answer, yes, I'm Hispanic origin, question one. Question two, what race? They check black, right? They do that only checking black at 68 to 65%. Meaning I wanted to sort of express sort of like there are real numbers here. I mean, they may seem real small compared to like the vast population, right? But, but there are reasons why that number can be grow, can grow as well, but they're not in a significant amount of numbers, right? So a million, right? 
on the table right here. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, um, as far as like my view about this sort of being the made up problem um, is because for instance, the both the use of the some other race box checking, right, of, of Latinos and the explosion in the numbers counted as two or more race are both about coding issues on the part of the census. This may sound like a little nerdy point, but I can, I think, can make it real clear because, and y'all will know that the devil is in the details, right? So here's what I mean by that. Um, when a Latino, since 2010, right, would check, yeah, I'm Hispanic origin, and then also check white, they check white. Then they thought, okay, you asking me about myself? Let me tell you more about myself. My people also happen to be from Mexico. And then they would check. They would go down to some other race. They saw an empty box there. Well, let, let me fill it in. I'm very proud. So they fill in Mexico. But they let you know, right, that the answer to the race question was white. What did the Census Bureau do then? And what do they still do now? They take that white, Hispanic, and they count them as some other race two or more races. I mean, oh, they're confused. They don't understand. They understand. They responded. You decided to take the extra information and create a problem uh, as if they don't understand. You know, they pathologize Latino responses to the census forms. There are ways to address that, but not this way. Okay. Why in 2020, this huge explosion, two things. Census Bureau decided to innovate <laughs> um, based on what the OMB was starting to do testing on, as we see in the proposal, that is next to each race box, conflate it with some ethnic origin identifier. So like, you should check white if your people are from, and I look at a little form right here just so I can remember, if your people are from Germany, Italy, Ireland, Poland, et cetera, right? And next to black, if, you're, if you've identified as African-American or Nigerian, Jamaican, Ethiopian, Hawaiian, excuse me, Haitian, not Hawaiian. Right. So meaning both, how, how is, are you race? I mean, how do people view you as other and the, so decide how to include or exclude you more often than now based on your racial appearance? And then also, what kind of foods do you eat? What kind of language do you speak? That's ethnicity, right? So they mean these correlations. You will notice in the two parts that I just gave you the example of, Nowhere in that list on the white or black was there any, any peoples from Latin America or the Caribbean, the small exception of Haiti. <laughs> they allow Haiti to be part of the black uh, box, right? Um, and you could also then fill in things additionally if you wanted to. So nowhere is there for a Latino to put ethnicity except under the Hispanic race box, right? You would check Hispanic and then you could fill in the bar. So 2020. A Latino who checked, I'm Hispanic, then went to the race box, right? And saw, oh, you do can you can do white and you could do black, et cetera. And they're also asking other people about their ethnic origin. Let me check white. And then right next to the little white box, you don't have to go down to some other race. Right next to white, there was a fill in the blank. If we didn't, if you weren't part of Germany, Italy, Ireland, Poland, England, France, right? You wanted to say Romania. And you didn't, so you want to write that in. They let you do that. If you wrote in Argentina, Mexico, Venezuela, et cetera, the Census Bureau counted that as two or more races. Voila, your explosion of multiracial identified people according to the census. Of course, because they coded a white Argentinian as two or more races. And then they do the same thing with people who didn't fill it in under white, but then filled it in under some other race as well. Right? So meaning uh, this is not sort of pure accident. Other than a little angle to why the explosion, let's keep in mind when the 2020 census were being, was being administered. It was during the pandemic, after the George Floyd murder, with all the activism on the street, people trapped in the house, watching this stuff go down on television or out in the streets themselves. Right? That is to say, that that was not a proud moment for white folks to identify as white. You know, white fragility, strong, right? So in addition to uh, white Anglo people rediscovering their Cherokee ancestry, <laughs> there's that, but the vast number of Latinos who finally, because of social media and greater access, had to listen to Afro-Latinos. 
This is not new. Our opposition is not new to having our race be treated as an ethnicity, but they never were able to, uh, they, they could dismiss us because we're not on Telemundo, we're not on Univision. We are not part of the stereotype of what looks like Hispanic. Indeed, they don't speak to us in Spanish when they see us on the street because they presume that we must be from someplace else, right? Um, and so when you put those two things together, what you have is between the coding and then the sense of white fragility, let me rediscover all my multiple roots and not just say I'm white. You have there this huge explosion. So that, right, uh, you know, to just kind of put the concrete numbers on the table, right? The, for instance, the Latino white only racial category, right? Latino checking white only, never checking anything else, right? That declined by 14 million people. 2010 to 2020 census at the same time that the white in combination with some other race increased by 15 million. Right? Th I'm going to actually stop you there, Professor. I know. I, I mean, so if you can't put the, some of the numbers in the chat so, so others see it, the reason why I'm going to push us to now try to move forward is because we actually have Chairman Horsford. But before each of you leave, I would like to give you each, like at least 30, 40 seconds to really, you know, if, if you can, I know it's a lot to sort of, you know, pack into 30 seconds, but can you just tell us, right, if this initial proposal goes through, meaning specifically the combination questions, what do you see as ramifications, positive or negative, and what can be improved if you have an issue? So if you can do that in 30 seconds, each of you, I'm going to ask Michelle to go first, then Julio, and then we'll end with, with Professor Hernandez. Sure, thank you. I mean, I think it, Briefly, the, the in particular, you'll have lots of undercounting. I think it'll there'll be it'll there'll, there'll be a, a way of skewing the real numbers of of the, of, of, the, of racial and ethnic communities, uh, which I think will also have deep ramifications in the way, as I said before, the resources, um, the politics of it. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be it's very it's very problematic, and I think it's I think I find it uh, to be. A real discredit to the people who live in the United States to say that they don't, that they won't understand. In fact, even as Dr. Hernandez was saying that they do understand, and yet it's the census who've been re, who've been changing things up. So it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. I've always said that it needs to be separate because you there are ways to to get at the data if if they, if you ask the right kinds of questions and do it, but doing it like this is is not the right way to do. It. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee Vasquez. I think it was an important point. Um, Julio, could you please uh, give your 30 seconds and like, what are the implications? What is the impact? Thank you, Yoma. I, will, I want to take a step back and invite everyone to provide responses to the Federal, Federal, Federal Registry Notice. Uh, the, whether this goes through or not depends on our ability to mobilize and deliver responses uh, that uh, speak to uh, the interests of our com community. Uh, the second thing that I want to bring to your attention is that we're going to have to do a more rigorous work to make sure that our population is counted. Uh, members of uh, this segment of the Latino population, uh, and I'm talking about in the case of Latin America, one third of the population is Black, uh, from Mexico all the way down to Brazil. We are not a minority, and well, uh, the, the results of this will bring us down. Uh, and I just want to conclude by saying that in, in the 2010 census, almost 48% of Latinos self-identify as white, which is something that many of us know that is not the reality. Uh, thank you, Yoma, and we are here to follow up and question. Absolutely. You know, I'll follow up with you. Thank you so much, Julio. Yeah. And of course, Professor Hernandez, I'll give you the last word, and then we can uh, introduce our chairman. Okay, I'm sure that what people will say to you, Naleo types and what have you, I call them like I see them, is that, oh, well, that's not going to be a problem because people can check all that apply, right? You can just respond to, you could do Black and you could do Hispanic all at the same time. But let's put in the reality check. Sociologists and many others who study race and ethnicity will be quick to let you know, when you put Latino next to Black, as if these two things mean the same thing, what a Latino re reads that is as, oh, then Black doesn't belong to me. That belongs to African-Americans, right? They, if you're going to say these two things are covalent, right? That's going to be viewed as, and, and indeed, the census uh, testing of this uh, through the NCT, more acronyms I know, but in any case, was faulty. They didn't test this 
where there were actual Afro-Latinos in the Northeast of the United States. They didn't include Afro-Latino expert witnesses with regards to these issues of race and ethnicity on their advisory committees, or none to our knowledge, right? Um, and so, you know, there's problems with this. The other thing as well is that 2017, when we were doing that data collecting and testing the um, uh, proposed questions, that's a long time ago by the time we get to 2023. It's also after 2020, right? Uh, racial reckoning or an attempt thereof. And two, after October, 2023, hello, or 2022. Hello, Nuri Martinez and the LA City Council implosion. Meaning the dirty laundry is now out, out of the closet and into the streets. Right? And this notion of trying to treat all Latino as being an uh, ally and understanding race is, you know, now under attack. And that's why they have to listen to us. And that's why we have more of a seat at the table, even though it may look to others as, where y'all been? What's the first time we're hearing this? Well, that's because you haven't, well, you, that urbanly, that is to say, the public, right? Um, and Latino leadership has not enabled us to be able to be in the group. Okay. Thank you. You know, we can hear from, from both. So, so first of all, Ayoma, thank you all so much. Ayoma, I have a yeah. question. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Hold on. The president has a question. So we, we have a very practical thing we have to confront. We have to uh, comment on this proposal. So what I hear from the, after, what guidance would the experts give us? Is the idea here to keep as is, right? Or is the idea here to suggest something other than what is and also distinct from what's being proposed? I'm looking for some practical advice here. May I respond? Okay, go ahead quickly because we have to. Uh, okay, the, I think the first line of defense has got to be do no harm. So meaning at this moment, keep status quo. Actually stick to 20, 20, 2010 census questions. I mean, don't try to converge race and ethnicity together, right? So there's that. So the first line of defense has to be do no harm. Then secondly, maybe what needs to be done is to look at the ways in which uh, People, folks need information about how the census data is used, right? So meaning we could move to other questions like what's your street race? How do people see you on the street? Um, we could move to questions about the way in which culture could be separate, sort of viewed as a separate category as opposed to the racialized questions. Meaning there are, that's gonna take me more than 20, 30 seconds to sort of respond and sort of what the alternatives are. But my short point is there are alternatives. There are folks are out there. What the Urban League and others could do is simply say, look, and, and at, the, at the census of testing of these questions was problematic. Where they say there would be no decrease in black numbers, that is not quite accurate. Um, and I, I, I have given AOMA, but I can continue to reply, yep. give you that data about all this in short little bu bullet points. So y'all can just roll with this um, to be able to say, we want to be allies to the Latinos, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, this we have to do no harm. And this is not clear that it would do harm. Thank you. Does that help, Mark? That starts to help. Okay. We'll, and, we'll get, and we'll obviously have offline conversation. Yep. We'll hear from many others. Um, I just want to thank again, Professor Hernandez, Dr. Ree Vasquez, and Julio Guete Guevara for really in joining us. And I know we'll continue to talk with you all as we shape our uh, feedback. Um, so thank you so much. So now I know without further ado, I'm going to hand it back to Jerrica to introduce our special guest uh, uh, speaker here now next. Thank you again. Jerrica, I'm handing it back to you. Um, many thanks to you, Ayoma, and to all of our speakers. This has been a really great and rich conversation. Um, as Ayoma mentioned earlier, we have been joined by our special guest for today's convening, Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative Stephen Horsford. Chairman Horsford is the representative from Nevada's 4th District. Um, in the 118th Congress, he is focused on protecting the progress House Democrats made in the 117th Congress, protecting our democracy, and creating economic opportunities for Nevadans. Representative Horsford made history as Nevada's first African-American state Senate majority leader. And in addition to chairing the CBC, Representative Horsford is also a member of the House Financial Services and House Armed Services Committees. Um, welcome, uh, Chairman H Horsford, um, and we'd love to hear uh, from you about your priorities for this Congress and the Congressional Black Caucus as it concerns the Black community. Uh, in particular, we'd love to hear your thoughts about improving the census, especially with the continued undercount of Black communities. Welcome. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you very much, um, Ms. Richardson. It's great to be with all of you, President and CEO Mark Moriel. It's great to see you uh, again. I know we were together last week for the Urban League's Legislative Conference uh, and Summit. And of course, uh, Ms. Melanie Campbell um, uh, also for her tremendous work um, and all of you uh, who are part of today's uh, convening. Uh, with me on the line is Vincent Evans, our Executive Director for the Congressional Black Caucus, who I know talks with you all on a regular basis and who can help follow up uh, as well. Let me just start really at the end, which is the census, because that's where it really begins. Um, I'm, I had I have served previously as the chair for the CBC's 2020 census, uh, so I worked very closely with the National Urban League and other organizations to help our members um, get out in a very difficult environment uh, so that we could have um, as complete and accurate of a census as we uh, did um, under the under the Trump administration and all the challenges uh, that was imposed by them and the pandemic. Um, and so I look forward to hearing all of your recommendations because some of this is systemic. Um, you know, while we've had a census um, since the founding, it's also been very structural to uh, intentionally undercount black people and people of color uh, because this is about representation and resources that are allocated from the federal government. And we know based on all of what we're seeing now in this current uh, Congress uh, that they're doing everything that they can to defund uh, I had to press the wrong button. Oop. Did we lose the yeah, uh, to press the wrong button? That happens when you're on the phone. Give him a second. Yeah. Um, while hopefully he'll be able to join us. Um, uh, Vince, can I turn it over to you if there's anything that you wanted to add on the black of um, um of course oh. you would do that. And look, he's back. He's back. <laughs> I'll just say hit the wrong uh button. So um as I said, we look forward to hearing all of your recommendations and commend you on the work that you're doing to make sure that we have a more complete and accurate census going forward. A lot of this is structural, as I indicated. Uh, but let me uh, pivot back to the priorities of the Congressional Black Caucus for the 118th session. Um, as I said last week um, at the Urban League's meeting, uh, we have one focus, and that is to win. Um, not just to win the majority back and to make Hakeem Jeffries the Speaker of the House of Representatives, but really to win in our districts every single day, every week, every month, to deliver from the benefits, uh, on the benefits from the legislation that was passed during the 117th Congress. That's everything um, to, from the bipartisan infrastructure, investment and jobs law, to the bipartisan safer communities law, to the chips and science uh, law and the climate provisions that are included in the Inflation Reduction Act. We are very intentional within the Congressional Black Caucus to make sure that the benefits of those laws, which are now signed and enacted, reach black uh, communities and other marginalized communities that have been historically left behind. That means making sure that we have our share of the jobs, of the contracts for small businesses, and that the investments go directly to the communities that have been disproportionately left out and left behind. Um, and while we're working in partnership with the Biden-Harris administration, we also recognize we have to push them um, and the departments that they represent to do right um, by the communities that we serve. So um, we look forward to, again, hearing your suggestions on how best to do that, um, but that is a, a priority for the Congressional Black Caucus. We're also very focused on racial equity and justice across all areas, whether that's education equity, housing equity, um, equity within small businesses and entrepreneurship, um, equity in addressing environmental injustice, we like to frame it around justice, as well as um, addressing what we know are growing issues 
around the mental health crisis uh, with our children, uh, with black men and women, and helping to make sure that we, again, are getting the resources we need to strengthen and build up our communities instead of uh, tearing them down or making them weaker. On the issue of the census, let me just say that um, we understand that this is about two things, representation through redistricting, and secondly, resources through the billions of dollars of federal money that is dispersed on an annual basis based on the information that is collected and reported on the census. Um, and so that is why it is imperative that we get this right. I do believe that the leadership that we have running the census are the right people and that they understand some of our concerns, um, but they also are overcoming, again, in my view, some intentional um, efforts during the last census to undermine and underfund the census. We have communities that do not feel um, as trusting in the census process um, and that they know in some cases that that information might be used um, uh, in ways that are not for our best interest. And so we have a lot to overcome from a structural standpoint and a historical standpoint. And again, I look forward to um, hearing your recommendations and suggestions for how uh, we can improve that. But in the end, as I said, our job is to win uh, for our constituents and in our districts. And all of you can help uh, build a better way to do that um, through the work that you're doing with the National Urban League uh, and other organizations. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, uh, but again, wanna thank uh, you for allowing us the opportunity uh, to, to be a part of this process. And I want you to know the Congressional Black Caucus and our members stand ready uh, as partners with you in this, uh, this work, both now and in the, the months and years to come. Um, I'm glad, I am really, really happy that you are talking about what needs to be done now in the census because a lot of times we tend to wait until it's too late to address some of the structural issues or the questions or the methodology um, that, that the census uses to collect and to report this information. So the more that we can get your advice uh, and input early in that process, Members of Congress, particularly in the CBC, can help uh, you know uh, get that information to the people who need it. I know in this case we have uh, Shalanda Young as the director of OMB, who is a partner with us in this work, uh, and who knows uh, desperate, who knows intimately how those uh, how that information is used in the disbursement of federal dollars uh, based on information that's collected from the census. So with that, I will turn it back over and, and see if there are any questions uh, that I can answer. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chairman. Jerrica? Yes, thank you so much, Chairman Horsford. Um, I do wanna just open the floor up. If there's one question, I know we are pressed for time, but I just wanna share that if anyone has a question, we will take that now. And then I also wanna note, thank you, Professor Hernandez for the reminder um, that comment um, is uh, available and will be taken up until April 12th. I think uh, Jerrica, just mm -hmm. for Chairman Horsford, I think we wanna put a spotlight on the discussion we're having now, okay. Chairman Horsford, which really revolves around uh, the change in a proposal pending at OMB uh, with respect to race and ethnic classifications in the census questionnaire. Uh, to me, I think it would be helpful because there are Afro-Latino members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, and it would be helpful for them for us to get their perspective on this proposal. I mean, one of the, one of the challenges in this is the discussion around uh, the classification of Hispanic Latinos the impact on Afro-Latinos, the impact on the overall uh, numbers for Af African-Americans and Latinos in other communities. Uh, there are nuances with respect to the Asian community as well. But what I'm, what I'm trying to grapple with is, you know, where we should land, you know, in the comment period. Uh, 
because we want to just not put a comment in for the sake of a comment, we want to put a comment in that would move the needle in one direction or another, depending on what we feel is best. But I think uh, you've got some members from New York, uh, I believe, who are Afro-Latino. Uh, it would be helpful to say, like Richie Torres, just to get a sense of where they, uh, what they're hearing from their constituents on some of these issues. Yeah, we're happy to put a survey out uh, and engage. We've got members definitely in New York and Florida who can provide perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the larger issue, which you all know, is, you know, this is a problem. This is a solution in search of a problem. They should be focusing on how to address the undercount of Black people before they try to figure out a way to increase the count for people who, I, who identify as both Afro-Latino. Um, that's my view, <laughs> uh, without having talked to the rest of our membership on that particular issue, because we're taught, I believe that the number is right. We had something like 5 million black people who were not counted in the last census. Um, and even in the 2010 census, which was done in a more equitable and ep efficacious way, we had a, a, a historic undercount of black people. So, you know, I will ask uh, Vincent and, and our staff to work with our members to get you that feedback that you're looking for. But I guess what I would make sure is we lean into the fact that the census needs to be implementing questions and programs and outreach that increase the undercount of black people as a whole. And that should be key. Yeah. Thank you. Mark, if there are no other questions, I turn it over to you to close us out. Yeah, let me just thank Chairman Horsford and the engagement of the panel was, uh, I think, insightful. I see several affiliate colleagues on. Thank you for joining leaders of other organizations. Thank you. Chairman Horsford, you're busy, you're in high demand, uh, and we appreciate you taking time to drop uh, some wisdom and insight uh, on us, and we will be in touch with you. So let's give Chairman Horsford a big round of applause, uh, everyone, for joining the Black Census Roundtable discussion today. I want to thank my good friend, Melanie Campbell, for continuing co-leadership of this effort, uh, as well as all of you, as well as the staff. We're going to take all of this under advisement uh, and try to construct a uh, the best pathway forward uh, for, uh, for our concerns and our interests. Uh, you know, we work as a Black Census Roundtable, we work with broader coalitions as well. Uh, and so we have to be equipped when we go to the table uh, to understand what, what our suggestions are uh, with respect to this very important set of issues. But one thing I agree with Chairman Horsford on, and that is the need for there to be a greater emphasis on the undercount. The undercount is too systemic. It's too baked in, and you just get a sense that some people take it as a given. We will never take it as a given. We have to be fully and completely counted. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for joining. Any other business to come before the Black Census Roundtable today? If there is no other business, hearing no objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, yeah. thanks, thanks everyone. Mark. Thank you all.